Hello, everybody. Chris Gethin here. Welcome to another episode of the Knowledge and Mileage podcast. Before we get into the show, if you do like this show, if you think it's worth it to you, please do leave us an honest, unbiased rating and review. That does help us keep the lights on. Um, and the guest that I've got here, I've been waiting a long time to have this guest on. We've been going back and forth. And then, just unbeknownst to me, he happens to show up on my TV on now, which is the number one uh, show on Netflix, which is called Down to Earth, that he co-hosts with Zac Efron. And this guy is known as the superfood hunter, aka the Indiana Jones of superfood hunting. And his name is Darren Ollie. And welcome to the show, sir. Hey, thank you, man. It's great to be here. It's awesome to have you on. So you're a super food hunter. Like that grasped me immediately. And I heard about you initially when I was visiting with uh, Lyd and uh, Gabby Reese, Lyd Hamilton, of course. Uh, there I was, uh, I've done it. He's been on the show before and I went there and we did the soul destroying XPT workouts and uh, your name came up and I never really thought about it. And then I heard you on a couple of podcasts and I thought, wow, this guy is fascinating. And then I heard about the Baruka nut, and then I've got jars of the trail mix and the Baruka nut uh, here at home that goes on my salads, it goes on the road with me, and unfortunately, you just can't stop at one uh, handful by the looks of it. So I wanna talk about that as well. But off the top, what is a super food hunter? Like, what are you, Darren? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, it was something that was coined uh, from an old article in Business Week that this guy followed me around for a bit. And, you know, he was like, you know, he kind of coined that name and it stuck because it is so grabbing. But really, I mean, it comes from humble kind of beginnings of that because it was really, you know, coming from uh, exercise, phys, and kinesiology, and nutrition background. I started digging into the exploration of of herbs and plants, and started studying them a lot more. And and, and there are moments in my life where I realized, you know, I'm I'm pretty upset or frustrated with how people are formulating. At least they have an idea, and trying to market something as great, but then there seems to be a left turn that a lot of people make or a compromise. And so I kept seeing this in the food, food systems and what are on shelves and also in the supplement industries. So for me, it was this moment where I said, listen, I got to really understand this stuff. I'm, gonna, I'm starting to formulate state. I'm starting, I'm traveling around the world. I'm starting to see botanicals and uh, food applications that no one's seen before. And so that's where it really, the responsibility of really understanding where things are coming from and how they were used way before I'm getting a hold of them. For, so for almost this ethnobotanical approach of like, who, who are the people? What's the culture? How is the culture and the people use these traditionally? It's important to understand that. Um, and then how are they grown? And then how is the system in place? And are those people taken care of? Are they doing it in the correct way in terms of getting the, the modernized version of that out in the market? So it was really that. And so by traveling and really, dude, it was really about, you know, my father was an ag professor at the University of Minnesota. My cousins, my grandparents, they're all farmers. And Nordic kind of and also I've got a little uh, Welsh in me as well so so it's really that that whole history of of kind of to the earth people it was really my innocence it was like okay well I want to do something with these botanicals so I just have to meet the farmers <laughs> and it just so happens they weren't you know they they they're on mountaintops they're in jungles they're all over the place so that's really where the innocence really of the superfood hunting happened it just you know the guy did an article the the term stuck but it was really the 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 need to do it because of our modern day kind of cutting corners and certainly 
uh, a lot of big companies just don't have an individual's interest in mind. And I just wasn't okay with just taking any old ingredient and throwing it together and formulas and stuff. So that's really where it came from. And, uh, you know, and, and, and in that pursuit, the constant kind of getting exposed to a culture, a new way of being, uh, an environment that I've never seen before, the interaction of all of that together, you can't help but to come away with this broader view of, and, and this deeper understanding of what, what are their struggles and, and how is the environment going to be best supported in this endeavor? And how are these people uh, best supported in this understanding. So you have to understand the environment. You have to start to understand the culture. And, and so I got exposed to a lot of environmental challenges. And that's where my broadening of superfood hunting has happened in terms of just being an environmental advocate and also a solution-based junkie of things I've been doing on the side and now I've put more in the forefront. So it all kind of, as we know, you know, we, we try to kind of think about our lives and think about projects and ideas kind of a, from a reductionist standpoint. And in a lot of ways we need to do that in order to take actions, but, but ultimately every action is pleomorphic. It's not just a linear, um, choice because it may be a choice from a mind perspective but it it's always affecting a lot of people uh it's affecting people around you it's affecting the environment by by what you're doing and that could be you know you know single use plastic for example i mean that that little choice that you think you're myopic in is actually affecting the whole so so my life has always been about you know, when you're around 30 to 40 countries and intimately in, you know, villages and jungles and stuff like that, you really see the effect that that has on people. And so that's, anyway, that's my long winded uh, answer, but that's, that's where it all came from. And that's where it's also growing from. Right. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Like I, I like that answer because you know, being a superfood hunter, of course, you're looking for these foods that are, are classed as superfoods. But not only that, you're looking at it from a sustainable, ethical, environmental picture, which, uh, you know, which is a great 360 degree look at it, you know, because to ensure that you're doing it the correct way, like, I used to be one of those meathead bodybuilders that wouldn't have a single use, like small bottle, but I'd have a gallon bottle, but now I've moved up to like the flask which is a gallon, even though it's a bit of a pain in the ass, it's a small sacrifice to make in order, if we all want to see that success, you know, because, you know, people, especially kids, they learn by observation. And I think that's a great thing about the show that you did um, with Down to Earth, that you show, you know, how people are impacted, how families are in impacted. Like we have a, a small, similar stories where, I have a supplement company and I go, I've been to India and various countries where I show, okay, this is where our caffeine, we have an organic caffeine in our product. This is how it's harvested. And we do that with Pure Caf uh, partners and show how we will then look after the farmer's dental care because they haven't seen a dentist for 15, 20 years, you know? So we have to contribute to that because, you know, it isn't just getting an organic caffeine without the pesticides and the herbicides and the clean water but ensure that those farmers are looked after from an ethical standpoint as well we, we've done it with um with the cat like the ashwagandha and everything else that we use the adaptogen so it's good for us to travel to those places and we will take a video crew and then we put it up on our website so people can say okay this tub of protein or whatever it is they're purchasing they're not just putting their hands together and hoping it's okay for them but they can actually see and feel and understand what they're doing is a, a contribution to themselves as well so i've got i've got a question in regards to the superfood then what classes in your case a superfood what is a superfood well, clearly there's no true definition of it. it it's really, it, you kind of have to, I mean, you could compare 
an apple to a to a, a donut and really say, well, the apple is a superfood. And, and so it really comes down to to um, per calorie or per uh, uh, micronutrient uh, you know contribution to every bite you make. You know, so for example, you know, uh, and and you could also compare. I mean, an apple is an amazing. Uh, food that we kind of overlook. I mean, quercetin and antioxidants and 30, 300 chemicals involved and in the, the beneficial compounds that support the body. Uh, there, there's a lot of things to an apple. So I don't want to downplay an apple, but also you look at an apple compared to like, uh, the, you know, per calorie, like a moringa leaf. So now all of a sudden moringa has got chlorophyll, 36 antioxidants, um, more vitamin C than almost anything, uh, more vitamin A, more vitamin E. Uh, it's also got the contribution to the other oils from the seeds. And, and so now you're really going, holy shit, okay, well, the apple compared to the donut is certainly a superfood. It's got more nutrients per bite, and it's more con contributive to a healthy life. But then all of a sudden you take moringa and you take the same calories of moringa compared to an apple and now all of a sudden you're now that's a superfood so so it's really you know it's a classification that is 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 good to say but it's really also the 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 the, the difference is also the letting go of all this other modern day problems and the modern day fatalities that we kind of sprayed on pesticides herbicides larvicides GMOs, glyphosate, all of that other stuff. So it's also the 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 avoid of all of that stuff. So so you know you can have an apple that's number like has a classification of number four on the sticker, and that's that's known as being sprayed um, with pesticides. So 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 next thing you know, like okay, well that superfood is compromised. So there's a lot of different ways to look at. It. So you're really looking at a clean whole food that's from the earth and the more stress that it's under naturally brings about compounds that are bioavailable and bioactive for the body. So, and then you could easily, you know, but you brought up one of my favorites, ashwagandha. And so now you're also looking into super herbs. So the you know, super herbs, super adaptogens, um, and then, and then, you know, it goes on from there. But but it's really people need to look at it like, listen, this is a very vulnerable thing that we open our mouth to the world, right? To all the viruses, bacteria, molds, fungus, viruses, you name it, uh, pathogens. We're opening ourselves up to the world. So, you know, if you're shoveling junk in, then you can't, you have to understand that your body is going to be under stress and, and, and not being able to actually create a strong environment as opposed to a superfood and you're bringing in this whole healthy vibrant micronutrient rich polyphenol rich antioxidant rich uh, uh, all of these other compounds that are benefiting you so so it's really just understanding and be awake and aware of the contribution of food um, so that's that's my long answer to, to really what a superfood is, but, but it really also can be down. I can grow one biodynamically and from a permaculture uh, way and then uh, a monocropped way. And you can say, well, it's the same food, but this one's a superfood because it's got infinitely more micronutrients. I've done that before where I've taken uh, a superfood and I've compared it to the top in the marketplace and actually grew it correctly. And the, the nutrients were and oftentimes three times higher in almost every category. So, so you really have to look at soil. You really have to look at growing conditions. You really have to look at beneficial stresses. You really have to look at drying procedures of how to, to, to take care of a food because now, now you're into, you can't just say every food is a superfood, even if it looks the same. So, so anyway, that's, that there's a lot to unpack there, but, 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 but I'm just saying like, there's so many different influences that make something going back to my analogy, making something sacred enough for you to open your world, your mouth up 
to something. And I think that if people would allow that to be more of the prayer of their life, and I don't mean to, not from a religious standpoint, but this is a very powerful medicine. Food is absolutely medicine. And so if we're taking that on as reverence and saying, wow, this ashwagandha was grown by organic, beautiful people in India and dried correctly and cultivated correctly and grown correctly. Now it has its, its beneficial compounds in there to help me deal with the stress that I have in my life. And so I love what you're doing. I just want to make a comment about that because not a lot of people do that extra work. It's easy to blow that off and just grab the certificate of analysis and see the organic cert or whatever the cert is and just say, yes, and we're just going to market that whole thing. And as opposed to spending extra time, extra money, extra resources to really say, this is our transparency. We're there. These are the people we're helping. We're not only helping them have an economy, but we're also helping them their own, their, their health through dental and whatever. So, so I applaud you for taking that extra step because I see that all the time. Uh, and most Thank companies you. don't do that work. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and for our listeners, they can relate to it, especially from the supplemental point of view, you actually formulated the Shakeology for uh, Beachbody from my understanding uh, some years ago. And uh, you know, the, you know, then the supplement industry is like the wild west. You really have to put your hands together and hope that you're getting something that's not going to be contaminated at the end of the day. And you know, we do our dual. You know, and as you know, you really have two choices a lot of the time. You either put all your money into the actual product and R and D and take a very sharp margin in order to be competitively priced, or you don't and you put all the money into marketing and you don't have much left for the actual product. So luckily, myself and my business partners all have the same idea of where we want to leave a legacy. We feel that we have a purpose, and you know we can financially take care of ourselves in other means of investments and stuff like that. But we really enjoy this. This is a passion. We want to bring something to the market where we feel that we're going to merge the health sector with the sports supplement sector, making sure that we perform these videos, we do it ethically, we have fermented organic and patented ingredients, natural colors, third party tests, and you know, adhere to the Prop 65 Act, et cetera. You know? We wanna to try to uh, you know, um, cross, uh, tick all those points if possible and more and continue to do so. Because I think it's come to a time now where people have access to the knowledge out there, whether it's through yourself or they Google or on Netflix or whatever, and they want to take care of themselves because you get to a certain age and you're looking at, like you said, this particular superfood compared to this food that looks the same. And you have to think, am I healing my future or am I harming my future? Because every decision I make, starting with my mouth, is going to do one or the other. And we really need to make that conscious decision that we need to heal our future. And I really felt it uh, probably about six or seven years ago when I got mold toxicity. I was living in India, had mold toxicity. I was only sleeping like three hours a night. And uh, I was like burning the candle at both ends. And I was like giving myself a pat on the back because I'm a warrior and I'm a man at the end of the day. But I probably wasn't a good person to be about around. And then once I figured out that I had mold toxicity when I visited a clinic in Oldsmar, Florida, and I was there for six weeks to kind of detox myself, that's when I started taking a real deep dive at the sources of food that I was eating because you've competed in triathlon. I've competed in triathlon. I've done several Ironman triathlons, but I kind of train like a CrossFitter or a bodybuilder as well. I'm a, I'm a bigger person. So I consume a lot of food. So if you think about it as an athlete, you could potentially be putting yourself in a more compromised position than somebody who isn't because you're consuming more food. So I really started looking at the sources. Are they locally grown? And if they are locally grown, are they ethically grown? Uh, are they sustainably grown? Or you know, where I'm sourcing these foods, even though they may look the same. And it was weird because not only did I start to feel better mentally, you know, I'm looking at my coffee now, uh, to ensure that doesn't have uh, mycotoxins or anything like that. 
And then I started feeling better from a cognitive standpoint. But all of these little aches and pains that I thought had come from weight training and running, such as in my knees and my elbows, all started to dissipate. The bloatedness in my stomach started to go. A lot of these attributes that were kind of subconscious came to my conscious. And I realized that this was a direct correlation for me now sourcing the right foods, the right supplements, et cetera, hydrating myself the correct way and uh, you know, trying to do whatever I can to mitigate the damage. And some of it may come as, across as being a bit woo-woo, you know, like the earthing or grounding like you do, try to mitigate a lot of the artificial light that comes in and get out there at the crack of dawn and sun gaze a little. But it all helps. It really helps. And you could say, well, it's a placebo effect. Well, I track my sleep and I track my blood sugar. Sometimes I'll wear a 24-hour blood glucose monitor. And that quantification tells me, which you can't have a placebo effect when you're sleeping, that all of these are having a positive effect on my longevity and my presence here right now. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of people can learn from that and actually spend that little bit extra because it's a little bit less that they have to spend on their future with medical insurance or hospital bills or, or regret. You know, you don't want that one, that's for sure. So I want to transition now into, and I want to touch on a few things following this, uh, into the Baruka nut. Now, I'm sure a lot of people have not heard about the Baruka nut, much like I had into, up until about a year ago. And then I thought, okay, I, I got to try this because the nutrient value just seems to be off the charts here. And since then, I actually have a call with my team tomorrow. This is going to be prescribed to all of my clients as their, their number one nut option because looking at the nutrient value and how it tastes, it's kind of rude not to, you know, really need to get that out there, especially to the international clients. So no pressure. We just need to get this overseas. So can you tell us how you came across this Baruka nut and where does it come from? Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I'm still a number one okay. fan. Okay. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's funny because I put my nuts in the jar too. I just like to see them and I like to have them in there. And so I'm, I'm a jar person myself. Yeah. I put, uh, the, I put the trail mix at the back. So uh, my fiance can't reach it. You know? okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're so good. And I, I am consistent on, on my smoothies, on my salads, like every day. Um, so, yeah, it's funny because in this journey of, of looking at different botanicals, I was actually in eastern uh, Brazil uh, looking at palm fruits, this one that I actually highlighted in and uh, and uh, was one of them. And, and I was looking at some more acai and the batawa uh, and palm fruits. And and during that journey, one a Brazilian reached out to me. He said, you know, he goes, look, if anyone's going to know about what to do with this this nut, uh, this guy will. But he reached out, and I'm like, I never heard of it. I didn't. I've never been in this place of the Sahadu, which was the savanna of Brazil. So it's kind of like the a little bit of the south, you know, eastern, uh, even into the west, uh, cousin of the Amazon and a massive, massive uh, um, amount of Brazil. So it's this huge biome that no one knew about. So he reached out to me and he said, Hey, have you heard of this, this nut? And I was like, No. And he then he, I go, Send me some information. He started sending me uh, all of this information. A lot of it was in Portuguese. Um, and then I sort of look at the profile and I was like, holy cow, this is like, this is like better than any nut I've seen. And I'm like, okay, well, I take everything from a grain of salt because I don't know yet. I'm just reading some preliminary information. He sent me samples. Oh my gosh. As soon as I tasted it, I was like, are you kidding me? This is like minus the, the mold, speaking of molds, minus the molds that a peanut can harbor and carry. Um, this is minus all of that because it's a tree. It's hermetically sealed in a shell with one per fruit, as we call it. Um, and uh, it tasted like a peanut. It tasted like this almond. It tasted also unique and crunchy and delicious. And I was like, if everything that I'm reading is accurate and close to being the truth, 
and it's tasting how it's tasting from this unknown area that no one knows about, then we kind of have a home run. But a few factors, I have to test it myself. I have to send it to the lab. I have to see the numbers that I'm testing. Also, is it actually, is it actually possible to bring this out of this, the Sahadu biome and, and market it to the world? I don't know. So of course I have to go. So I'm sending off to testing. The testing comes back. It's blowing away almost every category of nuts. So now what we were talking about before, a nut is not a nut. When you're talking about the contribution of every handful that you're putting in your mouth with the magnesium, the calcium, the manganese, the copper, the zinc, the high, super high fiber, super high complete protein, lower in fat calories than any nut. So we're like, for, so per calorie, it is more nutrient dense than any nut by far, right? So, so all of a sudden I'm like, I'm fired up. I'm like, the next thing is put on the superfood hunting boots and let's actually see if it's even possible to, to gather the amount of nuts we need in a landmass that's a, that's about the third of the United States in total. So it's huge. huge and even mind, yeah, it's huge. And, and you're like, we're not talking about a farmed nut. We're talking about a wild nut that's spread throughout this whole area. So, so we went, we went to Brazil and now of course we've been several, several times and it was going to be a feat because we had to organize, we had to gain trust. We had to, I mean, I was sitting with elders and, and uh, I remember like it was yesterday, this woman who was the head of the tribes, she was 36 year old indigenous woman that was just smart, badass woman. And we sat there and go, this is our intention. This is the economy that can be created. This is your involvement would be crucial. And it was just hundreds of meetings like that. So the journey goes that we finally organized. We, we you know, some places that were going to be shut down. Baru was going away, even within Brazil, because they, they just didn't have the infrastructure to be able to bring it even affordable to their own people. So doors were being shut. And we came, we didn't know this, but we came in at the 11th hour and we acquired some facilities. We, we resurrected uh, the, 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 the very sacred Baruzeta tree and, and, and brought that economy back again. So, so that mission, of course, being, being the Sahadu, which is one of the fastest, if not the fastest, destroyed a uh, biome on the planet as of right now it's being destroyed faster than any biome that we know of and and although the amazon has got a pr behind it right and really trying to save the amazon which we need to the sahadu is really kind of um a place where people you know grab and steal and get control of the land and wipe out the native habitat again. So now our mission to seeing that, you know, I've been in tears in the Sahadu when you see that line of, of trees that are just stripped and it's just flattened for unsustainable cattle, for unsustainable beef practices, for unsustainable growing for the beef of corn and soy. It's heartbreaking when you realize that the Barozeta tree is a resource. It's, it, it is a nitrogen fixer. It's, it's facilitating growth in the, in the forest, but it's also now an economy. So we had to re-educate these people. Do not cut down these trees. And in fact, we're going gift, to gift them back to you. So not only are we planting trees for every five pounds we sell, we're also starting to diversify and getting some other organizations to reforest not only the trees, but other uh, flora and fauna and, and vegetation. So we're really, really committed to that. And so it's something to where, you know, transparency, it's something to where people can 
get, I mean, there's literally no downsides. If you are paying money for this product, you are benefiting immediately. If you put that in your mouth, you're receiving all of the nutrient density that, that, that it has that I explained before. And you're also, with that hard-earned money, you're also getting, uh, you're supporting a company that is reforesting an area that needs it desperately on this planet. So it's, there's really, and as well as providing stability for people that uh, need the jobs in these indigenous communities. So it's really something, you know, it's, it's, it's what I always want to do with everything that I find. Um, and so uh, we needed to create this as a business and it's been challenging. It's been, you know, we're having to develop machinery to speed up the process that's never been developed before. Um, we have to work in a landmass that's very large, uh, we ha we just have to develop things that haven't been developed, and we're we're and we're moving, and we're we're doing really well, and um, we just and this is what I like about circular economy. When you do things right, like we've been talking about, when you create the foundation of supporting a wild food, for example, supporting the indigenous people, supporting and bettering the environment and then providing something that absolutely nutritionally shows that it's superior, now everybody literally wins. And we take a modest margin. Um, I haven't taken $1 out of the company. I, I decided to not do that until it's at a point where it's got a foundation and all that stuff. Now, not everyone does that, but, but, and, but everyone, everyone has taken lower than what their, their value is in the company. Uh, and we are just committed to that. So I want, I, I challenge other companies, especially in the supplement and food company to do what you're doing and to also support the, the, the infrastructure of the very thing that you're trying to sell to the world. Because if we don't do that, then the prices, then the quality is definitely going down. I've seen this 99% of the things that I've seen, I've seen that happen. So quality goes down when demand goes up. That always happens. And, and then the price gets so blown out of proportion that it's almost impossible. And, and, and not to mention the farmer is the, the lowest on the totem pole. So they get squeezed and squeezed and squeezed for a fair wage. And, and next thing you know, they're, they're stuck in a job that they can barely feed their children. So it's a, it's a crazy thing. So that's, that, that's a Baruka story. And, and this is something I'm, you know, extremely passionate about. And it just feels really good to know that I'm giving these nuts away and you're eating them right now and knowing that you're getting amazing nutrition from a place that is actually benefiting by you eating those nuts uh, and people are benefiting by you eating those nuts. So, you know, that's, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a dream of mine that's being manifested now. And yeah, man, it's uh, it, it puts a smile on my face. And I, at the end of the day, uh, I eat these nuts like crazy still. And I, I still get a huge kick out of it and yeah, love a, them like, it's like now you've painted painted the the picture of the cicada and like the way that it's uh, been harvested and ethically processed. I kind of feel exotic eating these now. A Welshman feeling exotic is uh, kind of left. You are exotic. <laughs> yeah, uh, but th these nuts. So what I found was fascinating when I heard you talk about this is how these are picked and the fruits of this as well. Because I know, I'd love you to share this with the listeners on you saw a, a, a fruit that was a little bit older than the fruit that you just picked. And it's the fruit that I'm eating right now, by the way, because I absolutely love the trail mix. And it's, yeah. uh, I, love, I love a lot of crunch and it's got a crunch in it. And I, incidentally, I don't know if you've ever tried this in like, uh, like hot oats or if you eat oats or anything oh. like that. It's phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Because you're kind of getting that nurture and you get, kind of get that angry food at the same time. So it's the, <laughs> it's the perfect combo. But if you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, how that is, obviously you, you, you have to wait for that, uh, 
fall in order for you to pick it. And then talk to us about the fruit as well, which is the actual trail mix that I have here. Yeah, beautiful. So, so the cool thing is you can't kind of come into the Sahadu and start grabbing the fruit, the little, the nuts off the tree. So it comes in, in this uh, kind of hermetically sealed hard shell and it's got one nut per, per fruit. But it's got this interesting fruit layer on the outside that's fairly dry. Um, so there's a couple things. So you can't pick it early because that nut only finalizes uh, itself and completes its growth just before it's going to fall. So you can't, you can't kind of strip the tree. It has to fall to the ground. So you cannot run around and grab it off of the tree. You have to pick it off the ground because it, it has got to its perfect maturity. And, it can, and then it forms that, that nut or the seed. Uh, and so we've been developing mechanization to crack that nut. Indigenously, a little fun story is that they used to take the whole fruit and throw it on around a fire and then in the morning, it would roast the nut inside, and then it was easier to crack open. Now, when we first went out, they're hitting it with rocks. They're hitting it with machetes. They're trying to make some sort of, uh, we've seen all kinds of uh, uh, mechanisms that don't work very well to crack that nut open. Um, and that's continuously what we're trying to improve. But but the, the, the wild thing is, when you, when I, first started picking or picking this up, I, 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 you know, just started kind of eating the fruit and it was delicious. Right. And so I was like, wow. And then the, then I kind of forgot about it. We went back and I, and, and one of our now partners in Brazil uh, brought out like a five-year-old uh, whole fruit and it had the nut inside still and it had the fruit layer and it really didn't look any different than the one I just picked up that day. And so I just had like, well, what's going on? That's a fruit and it's stable um, from everything I can see. It's not rancid. It's not moldy. It's not, and it still tastes from my, from my just putting my, my teeth into it. So what I did in a bumpy car ride, uh, luckily I didn't lose a finger. I took a knife and I started shaving the fruit off because I was like, in, in order for the fruit to still be there, there has to be antioxidants. There has to be high vitamins and minerals just to be able to keep the stability. And there has to be um, interesting types of fiber in there. So when I started shaving, I brought it back, started testing it. And again, now the fruit itself just it blows me away. So we've got prebiotics in the fruit, which is a, it's a great uh, insoluble fiber that feeds our good bacteria. So that fruit that you're eating right now is an incredible prebiotic. It also has a a lot more fiber and a lot more antioxidants, a lot more vitamins and minerals. And so when we washed it and dried it, it was like, I don't know, I thought of it sometimes as like a, as a, as like a graham cracker in a sense, but with all these nutrients, right? So that's when the bell went off. I'm like, we can put this back with the nut and make this perfect trail mix of, of a little sweet, with all these nutrients plus the nut. And that's really where that came about. Now we're, we're still developing more stuff. And this is a secret right here. We've got a brand new nut butter mm. uh, that I've perfected. It is so delicious. It is the best nut butter I've ever eaten in my life. And we put the fruit, some of the fruit chunks back in it and it just makes this unbelievable experience. So, so now we're trying to utilize more and more of the fruit instead of just the fruit just kind of getting thrown away. Uh, we're able to bring that and create a whole nother economy and also another way of delivering nutrients. Phenomenal, I love that. And for the viewers here right now, I'm holding a, like a little piece of the fruit there yeah. that it's I'm like crunching on. And this is what the actual nut looks like for all of you all looking at. I don't know if people can see it there. But pretty it's sexy a nut. Pardon? Pretty sexy nut. Yeah, it's a sexy nut. Great curves. I love it. <laughs> and um, 
I actually had like the first rendition of your nut butter and that, that was good, but I only had like one teaspoon of it because the next time I went back for it, Sybil, my fiance, had eaten the absolute lot. So I can't wait for uh, this to come out. When, when is that going to be available, do you think? It, fairly soon. We're just ramping up the from R&D uh, and formulation tweaks when you have to scale something. So we're in our final throws of that. We're hoping in the next four to six weeks that it's okay. out on the market. We also have a, a chocolate, a deep chocolate covered barucas that's coming out too. Wow. I don't even know if I'm supposed to. I don't know if I'm supposed to say anything about that, but I just did. But um, that, dude, the the balance of cacao and the nut together with that crunch, I mean, it's game over. It's it's unbelievable. That's yeah. great. And I bet the nutritional profile through that as well with the cacao is going to be through the roof too. Crazy, because of course we use a, a, a fair traded organic uh, dark chocolate um so you're getting all of the brain boosting antioxidant effects uh with the cacao um and uh and then with the nut it's just an incredible it's a combination of two superfoods that that are kind of mind-blowing for sure that's awesome and I, I really can't wait for this to get further afield around the world as well and you know get that awareness out there uh, you know, because I know there's a lot of countries that would absolutely love this. You know, I'm, uh, I, I've been sending some over to my parents because my, uh, my mother absolutely loves nuts. And of course, we'd love to see these in uh, other places like in India and in, in, uh, in yes. uh, the UK and other parts around the, the world as well, especially somewhere like India, because this is a perfect transition because 62% of the country there are uh they're non-meat eaters they're vegetarian or vegan and you are a plant-based eater yourself which yeah. i found very su surprising when i first saw you because you are jacked can't see it right now because you're covered up but especially when we see you on tv i don't know if the tv does add 10 pounds but you look pretty jacked compared to zach next to you you know and you're like and this guy is a vegetarian or plant-based or vegan sorry so i would love to know what your routine is through the day because i've gone vegan myself for a couple of months and uh you know I, during that time of course i'm participating in ironman triathlon ultra marathon and i bodybuild as well but i found it very hard to you know very difficult to retain and keep my muscle size however you are pretty darn jacked and i'm wondering is it because your focal point is on superfood. So for instance, like we know that, you, you know, you love the Camu Camu and the Moringa and the Matcha. And a lot of these foods that you get from overseas or that you discover, it's very hard to get here. You know, I do a quick Google search and I can find them in powders, but I don't know if that is the same thing for me. So I wonder, what do you do while you're here, like in the U.S.? for instance, in Malibu, you know, what is your routine throughout the day? Is it because you put yourself in a parasympathetic state that you're able to recover better? It's the intention that you put out there. Is it the superfoods that you're eating? What is your secret? I tell you what, you're, 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 you're nailing it because it, it's, it's everything. And, and it is, and it is something that of course, um, you know, it's the nutrient density that I take very seriously. And that is not that I spend a lot of time because I'm so programmed through habits to eat a certain way um, from biodynamic local farming to growing my own um, to uh, about to plant two Moringa trees back on the property. Um, so obviously if you can locally go grow and locally source that's your that's your superfood that you can control and then yeah i've been exposed to some of the greatest foods in the world so so when i'm eating the moringa boost to my smoothie or the the barucas on top of the smoothie bowl obviously i'm throwing my shakeology in that i freaking help put together and help source. And so, you know, I know where my food is coming from. And then you talk about, so yeah, I mean, that's a rabbit hole and we could certainly unpack that for the next week on, on all of the different nutrients that I'm combining with. 
Um, I'm a big, you know, we're all kind of in this modern day world where we really need to take care of our micronutrients. And I'll just underscore that like micronutrients. And those are, you know, the, the magnesium, calcium, electrolytes, potassium, sodium, all of that stuff. But it's all about size of the molecule. So when they're in the food form or superfood form, they're in a molecular size that the cells can actually use efficiently. And that's usually in this what's called an angstrom size. And that can go in and out of the cells and be used by the body. So if I am going to need to supplement any of the those things, I go to an angstrom size uh, mineral blend if I need any more, you know, balance within that stuff. So I'm always from a micronutrient standpoint, I'm always monitoring and making sure and getting blood work done every year. Um, but then it is also mindset, you know, it is my, my, my daily functional movements, my, my, I, you know, and, and you brought it up. So I'll say, I mean, the parasympathetic and the ability to, for the body to be stressful and then drop into parasympathetic and that window is something I do on a daily basis. So if I'm, if I'm working very hard, I love working out. I, I always have, uh, I love iron. I love, I was just working out with my buddy in Colorado. He was, uh, you know, I trained with him when he was a 310 pound, uh, lineman in the NFL. And, uh, we, we laughed because we, you know, last time I was spotting him, he had 120 pounds in each hand, uh, of dumbbells, but, but our strength and we just kind of grabbed, you know, the strength is there. And even now approaching 50, I can still pick up, not that I'm focused on strength necessarily from a bodybuilding standpoint. Every once in a while, I love to grab, you know, the 100 pounders and just kind of crank them out and go, oh, yeah, it's cool. The strength is there. It's, it's there if I need it. Um, so my routine is, yeah, I meditate, I journal, I do all that stuff. Then I'll hit you know, usually with my, my good group of guys and obviously Laird and Gabby played a huge role in, in that, uh, working out with Laird for 13 years and, and the guys around him and the athletes that would come in and out. Um, but then the recovery, like nourish through food, but then shift. So I love doing something really stressful and then see how quickly I can drop the heart rate and sh downshift. Like I really look to do that as quickly as possible because i believe that that um that learning and that muscle teaches my body when there's stress there's stress and we need it sometimes but then when you consciously downshift the body gets that it doesn't stay in that stressful place so getting out of the cortisol is very important especially throughout the day and all of that stuff you don't want that running all the time so then, you know, and again, I'm hydrating, I'm, I'm, I'm a water snob, and we just barely got into the water episode. I mean, the water episode is blowing people's minds, but there's like 10 more layers to that. I've been at some of the, the scientists' greatest symposiums on water, and some of the things I could talk about, you wouldn't even, I couldn't even hardly follow, because it's so crazy how uh celestial and influential and adaptive water is and and from you know nurturing the body to getting rid of toxins to structuring so that it can be better used to delivering information to you know taking uh and adjusting things in the body and being a delivery system for nutrients i mean it's it's something that we don't really uh, acknowledge enough so water is a huge huge aspect and uh, yeah so that's a little bit of it but I, I but i think yeah i mean from every every choice i'm making i just don't it doesn't make sense to me to skimp on food in any way i will double down on on food and supplements and superfoods before anything else because i know that the the choices that i'm making now are creating the seat of my future that I'll be sitting in. So the nourishment that I'm doing now, both mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and also through that physical choice of food 
I'm showing up, I'm sitting tomorrow when I wake up from the choices of my yesterdays. And, and that to me, I've, I've, I've learned to really respect that because that longevity principle is, is something I reap on a daily basis. So, so to have the strength uh, and to have the ability to do whatever the hell I want. Like if I need to sprint, if I need to run up a mountain, if I need to uh, help a friend lift a boulder, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't question it because I'm like, oh, I'm sore or I'm not strong enough. So that's my philosophy. And I think, I think, you know, the, the title of my book, Super Life, came by way that I didn't want people to necessarily focus the rest of their life on what they're putting in their body. What I wanted is people to get into habits so that those habits are moving forward in their life, supporting their life so that they can then live the freaking life that they want. You don't want to focus your life on just food or just the right supplements. That's not the focus of your life. You want that stuff to be running in your life so that it can support you while you're focused on what you're here for, what your purpose is, what you want to contribute to. And God forbid we don't do that. I would be depressed if I wasn't aligned with that. And, and you know, from the show, you, re, you know that everyone's vulnerable and everyone really, I believe, wants to contribute to something greater, but you got to take care of yourself. You, you have to take care of your temple, your body, your being, your relationships, your mental and emotional states. You have to take care of that and you have to take care of this physical body that, you, that you're gifted with. And, and once you kind of develop those habits, then your mind expands and go, okay, why am I here? What can I do? And what can I contribute to that's beyond me? Because me is now taken care of. And that's ultimately the steps that I want to get people to so that we can have a, a momentum and a group of warriors moving forward, feeling good about themselves, feeling good about their contribution to, the life, to, to our life. And we all know life's a little sideways. There's a lot of weird ass shit going on and and you can get sucked down in all of it but you know what my goal is always beyond all of that stuff it has to be because if it isn't i'm going to get stopped by the next challenge and once a challenge comes and it does stop you because it will i then just set my next trajectory right my house burned down and it just put my goal way farther down the road and it fuels me now to this day and the commitments that I have to the environment, the commitments I have to people's health. And if it's not moving in those two ways, then I just don't care. <laughs> I just don't give a shit. I want to help people and I want to help the environment. And really, if it's not directly doing that, it just doesn't motivate me. Yeah. So. Anyway, that that was a that was a. <laughs> no, I love that. I love that. Uh, you really sucked me in there, as I'm sure you did everyone else. And I just wanted to touch uh, on that because you know it, it was it was absolutely heart wrenching to see the last episode of Down to Earth when you know you you found out on the last episode while you were in the Amazon, I believe, uh, that you know there was a possibility that your acreage that you had there in uh, Malibu was going to get burnt down and then whilst you're away from reception it has burnt down and then it shows you coming home I believe you were holding the camera because I wouldn't surprise you if you didn't want a camera crew around you at that time where you've come back and there is literally nothing left like how is that now here we are you know uh, you know like a, a year later or so the show has come out Okay, huge success. Number one on Amazon, it's given you a phenomenal platform to get that word out further. However, you know, you, you lose the property at the same time. Does something like that, I was having a conversation about, uh, to somebody about this, like, 
doesn't that balance itself out? I wonder how that is because it's kind of an emotional roller coaster. We've got such a down and an up. You know, d d does it like flatline between the both, or or how does that how does that work? Well, I think it's uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, certainly, you know, a uh, year and a half ago or so when it happened, there, there's no place where you feel you can understand what just happened. And so, you know, grief is something very interesting because it doesn't just happen acutely. You go through it and then you're, gone, you're done. Grief is layers and layers within kind of recapitulation of memories and patterns and, and loss and all of this stuff. And so there was no blueprint for that. The, the closest thing, which still was pales in comparison to losing my father, when I lost my dad about 15, 16 years ago, I had no clue how to grieve in something that intense. And I still didn't have a clue when I lost the house. But I, what I did say to myself is, and what I say now is nothing happens to you. Nothing. I believe this at my core. We, it's not happening to me. Like if a wave comes and whacks me, it's just a wave coming. I happen to be in the way. And so the fire came. It wiped out everything I owned, except the suitcase I had, the car I drove to the airport, and luckily my dog was safe. So obviously there's a huge amount of loss. So I just went into that space of like, just let it happen. Let all the emotions happen. Let it all happen. Don't try to put it in a box. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to mentally do something with it. Let it roll let it happen be with it and so you know at the end of that that episode you know i chose not to leave because i was like well my house is gone what am i going to do jump on a plane by myself and go back to i couldn't even get get to my area it was still shut down so for me the initial thought was that's why i'm doing this stuff because everyone is vulnerable. And that's what I said on the show. And I meant every bit of it. And I mean it now. So for me, once I started grieving it, and I was actually that was actual that footage was actually me seeing beyond a picture because I got texted a picture of my house to really see that it was gone. But that was the actual moment I was seeing the house for the first time. And I didn't want to turn the camera on myself. It felt stupid. But I'm glad that I did because it was contributing to something else. But it was I didn't even know how to deal with it. And I ended up just saying, fuck at the end, you know, because I was just, I didn't know even how to cry at that point. And I shed many tears. I screamed many things. But I think the most important thing is I wouldn't, and this is going to be gnarly to say, the gift that it gave me is so far beyond the stuff that I lost and the memories that I was connected to the things because I learned how important relationships are just extremely at a, at a much deeper level because of the love and the connections and the friends and the family that reached out. And I, and it deepened my resolve. It took me to a place of wanting to contribute to people's lives and contributing to the planet and helping to move the needle. And it deepened that whole thing and it gave me insight it gave me other connections and it gave me this warrior mentality under no circumstances will i ever stop ever moving towards something that i can help contribute to so with all of that i wouldn't take it back i wouldn't i wouldn't want that experience to be taken away from me so if that needed to happen, I'm grateful for it. I'm extremely grateful for it. And I even have more appreciation for the guy that was, and Zach and I, while we were getting filmed, I have more appreciation that the reception that people have for that is, is, is beyond anything I could have imagined. 
but I also take it extremely serious, not from a, you know, I'm lighthearted, I have fun and all of that stuff. But one thing I, I do not waver is my commitment. And so I feel committed to people that have been moved by the show. I feel committed to helping to move the needle forward and to keep this momentum going. And if we get a second season, which we'll probably find out very soon, uh, then so be it. I mean, I, I'm in... I'm in stuff that I can't even talk about right now that are clean energy tech that will blow your mind. That's working with the indigenous people that are, that are, there's so many things that, that I'm doing that I don't need to tell anybody about, but it's just at my core. And when I see things that can be connected, when I see that you can microgrid yourself in a different situation, you know, and I've never said this publicly too. I'm never taking outside power for any of the things that I'm doing ever again. So I, I am not going to receive power from the same company that potentially caused this fire. Um, I'm just not going to do it. So I'm going to spend my energy creating sustainable microgrid situations where people can be in greater autonomy and greater power with themselves because the technology is out there. And I know people, I know too many people that know too many things not to continue down this path. And at one point I'll be able to talk about them, but, but just to answer your, you know, answer more of your question. It's just like, I'll just say again, it doesn't have nothing happens happen to me. I'm not a victim in this at all. Um, I appreciate people's concern. Um, I am definitely not a victim and I am, I am stronger by a factor of a hundred after that episode. And I, I cannot ever and don't want to ever give that back in any way. So I am, I can say this in every cell of my body. I'm grateful for everything that happened, including the house burning down. So, yeah, well, I commend you for that commitment because a lot of people and as cliche as it sounds, you know, can say, well, it happens for a reason, but it did. You know, what that reason is that, you know, you, you've solidified your commitment even more. And it just goes to show that this is definitely your purpose. This is your legacy that you are going to continue to uh, pursue. Like you said, there's a lot of things that are happening right now, but that's not going to step take away any steps from your further mission, which is phenomenal. And one thing I wanted to just touch on that you said that you did scrape the surface on in the episode about water is something that I just want to touch on because obviously water is such a huge thing here. And uh, especially, there you go, perfect. I'd love to know what is in there, basically. So I have like a reverse osmosis system here at home. Uh, I remineralize uh, my water. Um, but I know there's further things that you do when it comes to structuring your water, like with, with crystals and whatnot. Like what, what should we be doing with our water right now? Obviously, don't drink tap water. Bottled waters, I assume, is a no-no. You know, what, should, what sort of water system should we have? Do I have the right water system? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I think, and, and there's, like I said, there's so many le levels to this. The first thing people should do, you know, we had the great Somal water sommelier on the episode and I love that guy. Um, uh, and, and he's getting into like this, this incredible source of water that around the world, but, but also those things are not sustainable for people to, to be buying water and bottle, even though they're in glass bottles, obviously exponentially better. And maybe using those those bottles and those waters for some sort of almost super waters, right? So it's nothing wrong with buying them. And I have several companies that reached out and want me to test their water and taste their water and all of that stuff. So I don't want to poo poo all bottled water for sure. But from a sustainable perspective, as a person, number one, if you can find if you have a spring and you have you have the ability to find a natural spring and you've tested it and it's safe, of course, that's your number one, because it's it's naturally vortating. Water never flows in a straight line. It's vortating, right? It's moving, it's chelating, it's receiving the, the frequency of the earth and it's receiving the UV uh, sun energy and, and that's creating electrolysis. So that 
along with the minerals as it's flowing and the oxygenation is increasing through that flow, it's, it's obviously able to structure itself. And that structure is something that's extremely important. And there's many different ways to unpack what structure is, but water is, you know, just, if I just give a little bit, but I don't want to get too far down the, without people taking some steps. So, so just, if everyone could hang in there for a second, I'll tell you some really easy ways to create, create some nice pure water. But one thing I'll just, who was originally going to be in the water episode, but we just didn't have enough space. Uh, and that's this great, my great friend, Dr. Gerald Pollack wrote this incredible, done a lot of work. Uh, he, he actually was a, a, a physiologist uh, based around uh, muscle contraction. So actin and myosin and how the, that, that would, uh, the muscle contraction worked and then realizing how important water was in that process. So then, uh, he did further research and realized that there is a fourth state of water. And so water actually, when it comes up against a hydrophilic surface, so when it comes up against uh, 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 a cell membrane, for example, what happens is there's this, like we're talking uh, less than a millimeter, infinitely less than a millimeter, where the water comes up to that surface and then creates an exclusion zone where there's nothing in that water. It almost desalinates itself. And in that, it exchanges electrons and, and protons and creates energy just by the act of coming up to the cellular surface. So think of that. I'm taking in water. That water comes up to the 70 million cells we have in our body. What he found was it creates energy by the electrons and the protons creating this exclusion zone. So that's a mind blower. By drinking and getting hydrated, that proves that it's actually creating cellular energy and therefore systemic energy for the body. So, so in that exclusion zone, in that structuring aspect of the water, that just blew everyone away. And so then, you know, you can keep going down that structuring rabbit hole because they're also finding that water, water can hold memory in a massive way. And the theory for some of the researchers are saying that in a droplet of water can hold as much information as a room filled full of data banks of information. So, so think about that now. If that's true, if water is holding information, what, what water information are you drinking? Where is this from? And if it is from a weird tap, now what are you doing to influence it beneficially? So you can't see this, but on here, maybe you can a little bit, it says love. Yeah. So this is not woo-woo. Their scientists have shown me data that shows that water is structuring itself based on influences of frequency and words are frequency. Blue is the cobalt blue is a frequency. It's closer to cellular health. There's a frequency when cells are healthy that, that mimic the same frequency as cobalt blue. So therefore blue bottles, blue bottle love. So, so there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of water. I have on demand hydrogen machines that create high amounts of, of uh, parts per million of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the greatest antioxidant known on the planet Earth. So when you're taking high amounts of oxygen, remember I said that before, I go directly into recovery. So now if I have an antioxidant that's pulling out free radicals that increase just normally through metabolism, so if you're eating a lot of food, if you're working out hard, your metabolism is moving. So just as a natural part, you're increasing free radicals. So now if I'm increasing free radicals and I drink hydrogen water, now I have the ability to get rid of some of that and stabilize some of the free radical damage. So there's a lot of things, but let me just break it down because I love this topic, but let me just break it down for you. So, and your listeners, and that is, Yes, if you don't have resources to these other things or a spring, a reverse osmosis is a beautiful choice because you want to, and the one thing that, it was a little tricky in the episode because the water episode was 
just in the sommeliers there, we had a back and forth that was getting into a lot of these things. And the one thing that I just want to distinguish is total dissolved solids or TDS is more than just the minerals in the, in, in the water, right? So he was talking about TDS as the minerals, the sodium, electrolytes, all of these things. The TDS also can be the volatile compounds, the chlorines, the fluorides, and the reactive uh, chemicals in the water. So you actually don't want high TDS, especially when it comes to pollutants. So out of the, out of the tap, you have pollutants. You just do. They're not getting out everything. So that's why the reverse osmosis doesn't allow those pollutants to go through that membrane and you're cleaning the water. So now adding a pinch of Himalayan crystal salt because that salt and those electrolytes are in the right size, the angstrom size for the cells to use those electrolytes for hydration. Super important, easy to do. Uh, distill your water or reverse osmosis, add a pinch of Himalayan crystal salt to your gallon or a half a teaspoon per gallon of salt. So now you have electrolytes, now you have conduction, now you have a, a vacant water that's not gonna pull that out of your body. So super important to add those minerals back in. And then listen, you know, you can, you can eventually then get a great glass bottle. You can put love or strength or whatever you want on your bottle to help structure it in a way and put it out in the sunshine also that that light coming through the bottle through the crystal is also going to help and shake it up increases some of the the oxygen uh saturation so those are simple things that you can do to and listen a reverse osmosis couple hundred bucks a distillation couple hundred bucks it doesn't take much and it gets you out of the plastic crap it gets you out of the 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 faucet water it just gets you clean water um, so that's where we do need to pure. I know that the sommelier was saying, you know, pure, purified water is crap. Well, in certain respects, I understand what he's saying, but in other respects, we need to purify water because the water that we're all exposed to needs to be purified in order to rebalance it and restructure it again. I would have loved to have heard this conversation in the show, actually. You should have went at it. I know. I know it was, it, we did, but it was just like, it, it was going to open up Pandora's box. Yeah. And so, so listen, there's, there's, there's these platforms like this where I'll be able to, you know, go deeper and, and expand on some of these things. So that's where I just had to bite my tongue and just allow, allow, allow all of that. That being said, I was blown away with the natural sources that he was showing us because I didn't realize how many natural sources of, these kind of medicinal waters existed so that was just fun uh as well to see him sourcing waters like this and exposing us to them yeah that's phenomenal and you know obviously here in idaho we have a, a lot of hot springs as well and it's great to see in the episode there in, in finland of you know the healing properties of water oh, yeah, well, saw, not just yeah. you know through consumption but through soaking you know through the largest organ on, uh, on our body being the skin, you know, I think it's absolutely phenomenal. So whenever possible up here, you know, I try to get into those hot springs as well. Very, very healing and try to filter the water that you're bathing in, that you're showering in. It's uh, extremely important. And, you know, coming from Wales, I grew up on a farm. My grandfather had like a natural spring there. So we'd go out there and fill up our bottles uh, there. So, you know, very lucky in that perspective. But the one thing you'll probably notice when you go to the UK, or Europe, nobody drinks water. You know, they drink their tea, they drink their coffee. You have to ask for some water. Uh, it's not as if you're going to get it. You know, it, it's you know, people. And that's one thing that I'm always trying to promote to my clients all the time, especially overseas. You have to drink more because the chances are their performance or their cognitive decline is because not because of food, not because they're lacking in sleep. It's usually because they're lacking in hydration. And as soon as they get that one down, everything else seems to fall in line. And I say, if there's one single thing that you can apply to your life today, it would start increasing the fluid consumption, not just the, the consumption, but the quality of it as well. But definitely increase it for sure, because they drink coffee, they drink tea, they have this diuretic effect, and then they don't even know where their coffee is coming from. 
it's a, a downward spiral. But yeah. thank you ever so much for being on the show. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Obviously, your book, Super Life, I've been trying to get hold of. First of all, I went onto Amazon and I said, yeah, you're going to have to wait six weeks. Then I went on there again yesterday and it said, it's unavailable. It's just must have been, yeah, unavailable. I'm guessing because it's promoted at the front of every episode of uh, Down to Earth that is just flying off the shelves. So uh, yeah, the, pub the publisher was reaching out and they're moving like lightning to try to get all of that restocked again. But there's still the audio and there's still the digital too. But uh, for those of you who like the, the physical copy, <laughs> apparently you have to wait. So. Well, I, I've been listening to you a lot on other podcasts as well. Like my good friend, uh, you know, um, Ben Greenfield, I was just in India with him just before the lockdown as well. And I've heard your podcast there. So I think I'm going to go for the audio book. You've got a pleasant voice and uh, that you can accompany me on some of these uh, runs in the mountains here. So I'll get that. But I'll put the link to this book in the show notes so people can download that they can read the digital version or you can wait until the the the, uh, the paperback or hardback comes back out and also in regards to the baruka nut thank you ever so much i understand that you are going to give all of our listeners 15 percent off and there it is coming in a sustainable bag of course and that and we're going to put the link in the show notes as well. But if you go to www.barukas.com, that is spelled B-A-R-U-K-A-S.com and type in Gethin15, G-E-T-H-I-N 15, you will get 15% off. And I suggest that you try the nuts and try the trail mix that I've got here. Wow, look at the dent that I've put in that just on this show. So please, listeners and viewers, be warned. You will not be able to stop at, uh, at one cup or one handful. But like you said, it's very versatile. Like I put it on my salad, I put in my oats, I'm going camping this weekend, it's going to accompany me. And uh, it's just phenomenal. At least I'm getting a superfood in me. So, uh, uh, you know, hats off to you, I applaud you. Thanks, brother, appreciate it. It's been great hanging out so with you. Yeah, really, really appreciate it. And for all of you, if you haven't seen it already, check out the Netflix show with Dana Ollion and Zach Efron, and it's called Down to Earth. So until next time, thank you very much, Dan. I really appreciate your time. My name is Chris Gethin, the Knowledge and Mileage podcast, and we are out.